and, um, and, and the refrain as it comes into uh, lyric verse from that tradition. Some of it nonsense. Mm -hmm. And he's brilliant at that, as is one of his great uh, heirs, the Northern Irish poet Louis McNeese, who was a poet who also had a great influence on me. So this little poem is in dialogue with them to some extent too, with that strange refrain. That image of the, the, the handful of uh, horse manure that some, someone is washing out in with the, the rain. With the grain, with a little grain inside to be Waiting baked. for the yeah. undigested grains. That, has come, that have come through the horse. That's basically where that poem began, with that you know, graphic. Where did graphic. that image come from? You know what? That image came from an account of contemporary famine in Africa. I read about it somewhere. I was so taken by it. And this, of course, is yeah. often where poems begin. They begin with a couple of elements. Mm -hmm. We talked about chemistry earlier on. It's almost as if one's taking a couple of components um, in that case, the hole in the wall, the, uh, that image of some poor person, you know, who, who, who with nothing to eat. Washing out the grain from the Washing the grain the from the horse manure. Yeah. And, you know, in a strange way, almost, uh, I mean, that in itself is almost a poem, just that image. Yeah. And in a strange way, because it's so powerful, uh, it sort of raises the bar a little bit. One's sense of responsibility mm -hmm. to, to, to that image is uh, somehow upped, you know, because yes. it's almost perfect in itself. It's an amazing image. It is, it is. And, you know, almost certainly anything one will do with it is almost, uh, you know, one doesn't want to be offensive to the power of the image. Yeah. I want to get back to this whole notion of Irish poetry mm -hmm. and um, an interesting little dialogue that went on some time ago in the, in the Times Literary Supplement that mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you about. Mm -hmm. um, uh, another poet, I think contemporary of yours, Seamus Dean, yes. um, wrote an imaginary dialogue between Yeats and Joyce in the TLS. Yes. And he had Yeats refer to you in this imaginary dialogue as a poet in exile. And you responded. Do yes, you recall yes, I, this? I do remember you this responded now, yes. in a poem that was also published in the TLS, and it began as follows. In the that latest issue mm -hmm. of the TLS, the other Seamus, mm -hmm. Seamus Dean, mm -hmm. has me in exile in Princeton. This term serves mostly to belittle the likes of Brodsky or Padilla and is not appropriate to me. I'll stop there. And I'm really fascinated by this, that you know, the whole notion of exile for the Irish poet, being home, not being home, the homeland, all this, wh where do you stand with the very fact that you wanted to write a poem objecting to having been told that you were in exile? It, it, do, do you protest too much? And what does, what does it mean to be in exile? Does it, does it have meaning anymore for, for a poet, for an Irish poet? Well, I, it may well do for some. Uh -huh. For me, it doesn't. First of all, the context of that poem uh, I embarked in, um, I believe it was 1992, uh, on attempting to write a poem for every day of the year. Ah. And I got to the end of January and, you know, common sense, <laughs> common sense prevailed. So pretty much, you know, anything... You did it for one month then. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. So any, anything, you know, that just happened to, that mm. happened to be an event, you know, something that... that so that's what precipitated that's you. That's what precipitated yeah. that, the need for a poem, <laughs> which is probably probably not the uh, the best best reason for a yeah. poem to come into the world but on the other hand i have a lot of time for Seamus Dean he's a great uh, poet and a great critic by the way uh, 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 but i do feel that you know to talk about me as an exile is just it's inappropriate i think it's a word that belongs to you know my friend Joseph Brodsky, whom I mentioned there, you yeah. know, really was thrown out of the, so of the USSR. Yeah. He was thrown out. He was in jail and he was thrown out. I, you know, have never been thrown out of my country. Uh -huh. I left at my own volition and I can go back tomorrow. And you know, that is a very precious uh, fact. And. You know, exile, I think... Does it have to be literal, though, exile? Well, I, I don't know. I mean... Do you think of yourself as a political poet at all? Uh, or, or I, I do, yes, yeah. I do, in the sense that, you know, uh, it, insofar as poetry must reflect um, 
uh, what is happening to one in the world and the extent to which one is making sense mm. of the world. Politics uh, is, ne you know, in the broadest sense, but it may include party politics, mm -hmm. is part of that. Um, though funnily enough, um, strangely enough, I was less, less influenced perhaps by uh, the Irish political scene and by party politics there, which um, I really didn't get involved in. Certainly wrote lots of poems uh, having to do with political violence in, in Ireland, but not really you know, saying that one side right, had it, right. as it were, because it's a terrifically complex circumstance, and one, uh, like, like so many others. Um, actually, I became, in a strange way, more interested in politics in this part of the world in recent years um, where I suppose I would be inclined to, hmm. to come down on one side rather than another. Interesting. Okay. Paradoxically, yeah. paradoxically. Um, and one would have imagined that that might have been more the case in Ireland. Uh, but anyway, the thing about 100 years ago, 150 years ago, if one left Ireland as a, 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 a citizen, never mind as a poet, the chances of going back there were very slim. Mm. <coughs> and even if one had loads of money to go back there was a major undertaking. Nowadays, one can hop in an airplane uh, at Newark Airport and be in Belfast within a few hours okay. for probably I less than it cost. Well, yeah. actually, you know, it it's probably costs about the same as it would cost for me to fly from Newark to Philadelphia mm -hmm. to fly to Ireland. It's much easier. Right, so in that sense, it's just not an appropriate label. No, I mean, I, w perhaps <coughs> I was protesting a bit much, but I don't like the idea. I mean, I wouldn't, uh, there's, uh, there's no, uh, no axe to be ground there in terms of exile. You know, in another era, people really did have to leave Ireland, mm -hmm. um, and, and including some of part of the era in which I was brought up, the mm -hmm. 1950s into the early 60s, there were Irish writers. But most most that famously, John McGahern, for yeah. example, who's still uh, with us and writing very powerfully, you know, who lost, his books were banned, who lost his job uh, because of his writing. That's not quite the case over there uh, at the moment. Okay. Um, speaking, though, of Irish poetry, I had asked you, um, because I know that you do translate from the Irish, whether you would read a few lines, perhaps, from an Irish poet that you have translated, and because I think a lot of people have not heard uh, this, and it, it would be it would well, be a, a change of pace. And I would like to hear you your translation as well. Right. Well, this now is a poem uh, by um, Nola Nigonel, who is the great contemporary uh, Irish language uh, poet woman who lives just outside uh, Dublin in a place called Cabin Teeley. And uh, in fact, uh, I'll read a little bit of, of it in Irish. She, her Irish, actually, she learned an, an, a version of Irish from Munster down in the southwest corner of Ireland. And I come from the north of Ireland, and insofar as I speak it at all, which frankly is not much these days. Mm -hmm. But when I did um, have more uh, occasion to speak it. My Irish was slightly different, different pronunciation, believe it or not, though it's only 300 miles up really? the road. Um, well, it's not so strange, I guess. Well, they speak like a, slightly it's like different. an accent of course. difference. Well, it's, like, yes, that and a, a little bit more yeah. than mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Dialect also. Mm -hmm. So mine was from Donegal. But anyway, so she probably wouldn't read this just as I'm about okay. to read it. La chachru an, so anyway, the title is Rark o Chabin Tila. La chachru an tolis tosnian na bruch walcha e Sharon is tagging Hakufen, Theresh Laila, a V full of four. Villain Lenny Oskalina is Dini Fasto and Ober, Sahar, La Huskild Finuga is Thursha Vroyat, the Dita, a Mango, a Hoor. Oh. Yeah, there are various words in yeah. there you probably would. Um, if I looked at it on the page, I could pick it up. You probably would recognize. Well, <coughs> Skullina is schools, Skullina. Uh, Tiha, that's the plural of Chach which is the word for a house. And that's just the same as the word tech, as in discotech. It's related to the Latin word tegus for a slate. Mm -hmm. What else? Uh, what about, uh, actually, let me see, I can't, uh, 
Yes, those are some of the most obvious. Could you translate what yes. you just Yes, so this is the read. view from Cabin Tilly, a swivel wing of light. The suburban drone kicking in after one more hopeless day. Kids home from school, grown-ups from the job, doors and windows flashing, grimaces, grins. A car backfires in the next avenue. The bicycle brigade in headlong, strangling retreat. Smoke rising from chimneys, those shades behind lace shades cooking up a storm. In backyards, football score direct hits between pines, a collie and an English setter dispute a bit of green, the thunk of a hurly ball, two magpies on the roof giving it their all. The picture windows now have a blued low where families huddle around their TV screens for news of the missiles and smart bombs falling on the suburbs of Baghdad, Tel Aviv, Dharan. Hmm. So that's a view of Ireland, of course, written in the Irish language, but that's a bang up to date uh, view up to date poem. of, of yeah. Ireland, you know. It was written in 1991. Really? But, uh, you know, the smart and, bombs. But if you, didn't, if you didn't translate her, it, this, this poetry would really be very narrow in, 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 in terms of its audience. Well, you know, it, in some sense, perhaps, obviously the, the English language has, has more speakers than the Irish. Mm. But one of the great paradoxes is that it may not necessarily have more readers of poetry. Mm. Now, the average sale of a book of poems by Noel and O'Connell here yeah. in Irish, in Gaelic, yeah. is probably 5,000. Really? Now, that is a very, very decent sale. That's an amazingly high number. Absolutely. Yeah. And why 300 is, it? is the typical academic is. book or poetry book being sold now. Absolutely. Yeah. So that, you know, that is, is one of those statistics that might make one revise one's sense of, of how things are. I mean, clearly it's a language that doesn't have the currency of English, as I was saying, but those who have it are very, very keen. They will, you know, a mm -hmm. lot of them will read a poet like Mula and some of the other, some really great Irish language poets. One of them just died, alas, uh, Michael David. But a uh, <coughs> number of really great poets in Irish, never mind that English, traditional mm -hmm. English that you're talking about. But for many of us in the English tradition also, there's an awareness of the Irish tradition and it's probably one of the things that is feeding into our poems and maybe well, giving them a slightly different coloration. Well, it supports my idea, and we do have to close now, unfortunately, that there is this tremendous lyrical sensibility to the Irish tradition, to, the, to your heritage, and that the very fact that these poems uh, can sell that number uh, is amazing to me. Um, yes, well, it's still a country where language is, uh, is valued important. and valorized. Yeah. People like, for better or worse, <laughs> a bit of chat. They like, uh, as they say in Reader's Digest, they like the, um, the you know, do you remember that column in Reader's Digest where it's more picturesque speech? Yes. They're very fond of uh, picturesque speech. Yes. And uh, I suppose they're, they're fond of stories and uh, they're fond of songs and they're fond of poems. Well, and I want to thank you, Paul Muldoon, because we're out of time now. And uh, we could continue chatting, I think, for another half hour. But it's been a pleasure having you today. And thank I you. look forward to your next book, Horse Latitudes, that will be out in the fall. Thank you. And thank you for joining us today at the Drexel Interview.